Uh, welcome again to this uh, uh, session, my brothers and sisters. I want to say thank you very much for tuning in and uh, thank you very much also for being, uh, for taking time to, to go through these videos. I want to say, I want you to know that I really appreciate you and uh, I'm always humbled uh, and, and I'm very thankful uh, you for you, especially for you who is watching me right now. I want to take this opportunity just to give you a testimony of my life and how the Lord actually healed me uh, from a pandemic, that great pandemic, which is the COVID-19. And uh, we both know and all of us are, are aware that uh, in the year 2020 was a very catastrophic year uh, in this, in the planet, uh, especially in the whole planet. Okay. And I know if it will have been just in my own country, Kenya alone, I know a lot of politicians will, will really speak of very evil things about the governments and all that stuff. I know how Kenyans, we can really politic. But now this is actually not politicking. This is actually real. And I would like anyone that can watch me and anyone that can see this video, please make sure you share to anyone, uh, anyone that uh, 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 is feeling so low. This, uh, this is a video that uh, I want to ensure that anybody that is feeling so low, anyone that maybe uh, lost their loved ones or anyone that is going through some serious struggles, uh, please make sure that the, I want to tell you today is that we have a God in heaven. Uh, we have a God in heaven and who is, is a God of second chances. He gives us uh, second chances. Irrespective of what it is, he will always give us second chances. Sometimes I know in the, during the pandemic uh, season, uh, we lost, there are those who lost their loved ones. Okay, I'm, I, I want to uh, give my, my, my sincere condolences and my sincere uh, apologies and my sincere, you know, uh, sorrowful to those families. I know there are those who had only, they, they had, you know, their brothers and sisters. And I know those who've lost, okay, husbands and wives. Uh, I, I know there are those who've lost even uh, their brothers and sisters. There are those who lost their own children. Uh, and there are those who've lost even, you know, their employers. Eh? There are those who lost their employers. I, I, want, I want you to know that I'm deeply, uh, deeply sorry and, and deeply, deeply uh, sorry for you. And, and, and I want you to know that you are always in my prayers uh, every now and then. Because every time I put my knees on the ground, uh, I, I always, always, always remember of you. There are also those who are in the service. Uh, uh, those who are in the service in terms of doctors uh, uh, and nurses, those who are working in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the health sector, including even the ambulance, uh, those uh, ambulance uh, 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 operations, uh, I want to say uh, I'm deeply, I'm deeply, deeply uh, concerned about you and, um, and especially to our dear doctors in Kenya. I want just to say thank you very much for what you're doing. Yeah. Our dear doctors in Kenya, I want to say thank you very much for what you're doing. And I want to say even our nurses in this country, Kenya, I want to say thank you very much for all that you guys are doing. And even if there is no one, even if there is no one appreciating what you people are doing, I want you to know that in this video, there is one man who really appreciates what you guys are doing. And that one man is it's me. It's me. You have my vote in everything. Uh, I want you to know that I really appreciate what you, you guys are doing. I've come to respect anyone that is working in the health sector. Anyone that is working in the health sector. I've come to respect that person. And I remember when I was young, I was hoping that someday I will actually be, you know, a medical doctor. I worked very hard to ensure that I become a medical doctor one day. But it never happened because uh, my story uh, never went uh, the way my dreams really wanted. And I think uh, you, you, some of you have gone through my videos. You know uh, what I went through uh, when I was in, in, in high school, both in high school. And, and uh, that is all, all is not lost because currently I have a son who is actually having that vision. And I pray that uh, uh, his will go and his visions will be actually fulfilled. And he's, he's, he's hoping to be a medical doctor because uh, my sister used to be uh, in this health sector. Uh, she was a medical doctor. 
and, uh, and, and probably I know my son will also make it to be a, a medical doctor. I have a son, in fact, three of them, who all of them, every time I ask them, what will you want to be? And they will say, I just want to be a doc, dad, I want to be a doctor. I want to, to someday uh, work uh, as a doctor, you know. And, and, and that one has, has made me actually, uh, you know, uh, really, really, really appreciate uh, what uh, these wonderful brothers and sisters in the medical uh, sector, what they are really doing. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And not only those who have actually gone through medical uh, schooling, but I want also to appreciate those workers who are actually working in these hospitals. You could be a cleaner, you could be a cook in these hospitals, you are a chef in these hospitals to ensure that patients uh, are really, you know, are getting what they deserve. Uh, you could be a cleaner that uh, you ensure that uh, where the patients are, you, you ensure that they are always clean and all that stuff. I also want to appreciate you. I want to appreciate you so much because I, I see your work. You know, I see your work and I see what you do. And um, one thing I want to say is that working in that area, it's actually a calling. Anyone that has a small heart cannot actually work in a hospital. Anyone that has a very small heart, anyone that is not patient, anyone that is not loving. In other words, if you are not charitable enough, you cannot actually work in that hospital. You cannot work in hospitals. These people who work in those hospitals are very charitable, irrespective of how they may appear. Some of them may look so arrogant. Some of them may look, you know, somewhat like, at times they may be defined as very uncaring. But let me tell you one thing. Those people go through a lot. Those people go through a lot. Those people have seen a lot. And those people, every day, they see a lot of things. Every day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And these are the people who need to be cushioned and they need, it, they need actually to be shown so much love than what maybe what we see today the society is doing for them. When I was young, I never saw doctors striking. But that is a story for another day. Now today I want to talk to you how I experienced the love of God and how the Lord actually, you know, healed me from this pandemic. That is the COVID-19. It was in March, it was on March 2020, when I had gone to work and I had a, a, a meeting because I was supposed to present something to a certain client. And this client was way back in Athi River. They were Asian clients. And they needed actually to see the solutions that we can offer for their company and how maybe we can do some integrations of certain things. Uh, for their company and, 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 and all that stuff, you know. And du during this period, it was a period whereby the government had announced uh, that uh, people are not supposed actually to work from, they are not supposed to work, they are not supposed to go to the office. If you are supposed to work, you need to do it online, you know, you need to work online and all that. And uh, it was very strict, uh, it was very, very strict and all that. And, 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 and I remember you could go to any office if you go to any office, you are supposed to wash your hands or maybe have even your mask on. And even before having a mask, you wash your hands. We could not even greet each other. You know, the world was actually in a standstill. And, 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 and that's something that was very, very much shocking to me. I ended up realizing that this, this, this universe is very gullible. So gullible. In the eyes of God is a very small thing. That if God wants to shut everything down, he can just shut it. Because remember during this time, a virus, something that can hardly be seen by a naked eye, something that cannot even be seen by a naked eye, but this thing called virus, this minute thing, actually shut the whole world, brought the world to its knees. I had never imagined that planes would be put to parking. Because as I was growing up, <laughs> Planes were always just flying, flying. But a situation whereby you find planes are being put to parking, that was that was very serious. And and, and this is this is was this is, this was what was happening during this time. So I remember talking to this uh, 
uh, Asian client and I told him, look here, because of the regulations and all that, I don't think even if I'll be able to come to where you guys are. So why can't we do this thing online so that uh, I'm able to show you uh, what we are actually doing online? And they were like, no, we have our director here. We suppose actually to be able to see it and also be able also to, you know, communicate to you uh, so that uh, you can verify some things to him uh, just openly here and, 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 and all that. So since I saw it was a business that was worth taking a risk, and uh, my boss was like, hey, man, you, you need to go there so that uh, you, you, you check on these things, but make sure you, you follow the regulations as per what the government has said and ensure you, you, you close this deal before, you know, because during those days also, business was very down. Business was not that. And, in, and if people, somebody comes out that he wants to give you business, you cannot actually take a chance on that. So I decided to go to... Uh, to uh, uh, at the river and I went to this company. I will not actually mention the name of the company here. So I went to this company and I went through their boardroom and I sat in that boardroom, prepared my laptop. Of course, they had a projector there. I took a projector there and I started now mixing things, fixing things. And all of a sudden, now I was ready now to do a presentation. So after some time, they joined me and I saw them coming. There were about six Asians. Uh, they came in. But one of them, who was a young man, he did not look good. You know, he, he actually didn't look good. He was not actually okay. And this young man was actually coughing. And you know, during those days, uh, during those, the pandemic periods, if, if somebody was just coughing, uh, you know, you would be very careful. You'll be very careful, especially if somebody just coughs and, and you're in a matatu, everybody will be alert. You'll be like, ah. And I remember those days, even matatus were not carrying a lot of people because of the regulation. And uh, this young man was really coughing, really coughing. And, and uh, I was so much concerned, even though I was doing a presentation, but I was so much concerned, like, uh, how is this, this guy he looks so sick here? So I did a presentation, finished my presentation and all that stuff and, and these guys were very much satisfied and they told me, now what you can do, just go and uh, prepare a quotation for us and then we will respond. So after that, I did, a, I, I went home, you know, I went home. But I was so much concerned. Could that young man, was he really okay? Was he really okay? You know. And uh, the, the funniest thing is that they had, they had told me that the young man had just flew into the country from India. And relative to what we were seeing in India, you know, and, and, and he came into the country. And I was like, how did he come into the country? Was he not actually, you know, placed in a quarantine area first before uh, allow him being allowed to to, to, you know, to mix, to intermingle with people. I don't know what they did. And something came to me and he told me, you know, you know your country. You know, money talks, money speaks. So when I went home, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was in the house, prepared the quotation, you know, trying to send a report to my boss. And uh, by evening hours, I started feeling like malaria you know i started feeling like i have malaria you know and i thought ah this one is just normal malaria that i'm having so let me just go to a pharmacist pick some malaria dose te, uh, and take so i to i went and took a drug called al for malaria and i went and took uh panadols because i was feeling my joints were really painful my head i was feeling a serious headache and my joints were very painful and then the temperature was also now increasing so I, I, there were just signs of malaria, you know, normal signs of malaria. So I went and uh, uh, bought some medicines from, from the pharmacy, came home and took them. And when I took them, I just sat a little bit. I felt like somehow, like the pain is almost going, but uh, the pain was almost going, but the signs of weakness are still there. So... 
so that 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 is how i felt and i was like now this normally when i take these tablets and normally if it is malaria it will not even take some time but now this one it is taking it is almost now 2 3 days the malaria is not going what is not happening so i didn't exactly know what was happening so i told my wife look here i'm not feeling well so let me go to the hospital here and see what exactly is wrong with me so i went to one of the hospitals around where i'm staying where i was staying uh, there's a hospital uh, called eagles nursing yeah so one of the best hospitals anyway it really helps the community so i went there one time and uh, i talked to the doctor the doctors looked at me I, uh, they looked at me and with them also they suspected this is malaria so what they did they were telling me go take your blood uh, let us you know check your blood and see what is it so i took the blood sample to them i i did everything and uh, they looked at me and they told me we are not seeing anything like malaria in your body so what happens you just take these antibiotics and go home so they gave me some antibiotics thinking that it was something like a bacterial attack and all that so i went and took the antibiotics took the dose but there was no difference and that is when now the pain was becoming so severe my head was almost bursting you know my head was almost bursting the pain was becoming so severe my appetite now was diminishing because i could see food i don't want to eat and uh i became so i started now becoming so weak to an extent that now if i walk two steps you know my breathing it's like i'm losing air and uh, I, be, i was like now now the, now the only thing was just for me to sleep so my wife looked at me and she was like no 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 if you see something that has overwhelmed this guy no this is serious Okay this 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 a guy this person is not a type of a person who will sleep just anyhow but if you see him sleeping just know this thing is is it's it's not it's not an easy thing so she decided to take me to a hospital another hospital somewhere just one of the doctors who works with the works with the KNH that is Kenyatta National Hospital but this doctor has a small dispensary just around where we were staying and uh, I took a border border that is for those who do not know what border borders are these are motorcycles which are commercially paid you just took them they carry you to where you they are like taxis but they are motorcycles so I took a motorcycle motorcycle I went there with my wife and uh, saw the doctor and the doctor looked at me and he told me you have an acute pneumonia So that is what he told me you have an acute pneumonia so what you need you need to take this drug so he gave me some very heavy antibiotics and some painkillers but he told me before you take them you need actually to eat you need to eat make sure you eat properly so i took that and went back home and uh, my wife made some food i ate and i took the drugs but when i took the drugs ah, it was not okay because i remember that night i was really sweating sweating at the same time shivering sweating at the same time shivering and my eyes were turning more white and i was becoming so emaciated and my hands were turning into purple you know my palm hands yeah my palm hands were turning into purple color so when my wife saw that those sudden changes she was not actually you know comfortable and she was like what exactly is happening with this guy so what happened is that uh, they told me now she decided now to take me back to that doctor again so when i went back to that doctor the doc looked at me and he said okay your hands are really purple so she the the doc again you know had to check my pulse rate so she measured my pulse rate and he said my pulse rate were kind of like normal they were okay so what you just need is that it seems like the drug i've given you it's actually weak so i need to give you another more powerful drug more powerful drug so he gave me another more heavy drug an antibiotic i can't remember their names but they were in a big sachets like this this i wish i had those sachets i would have shown you 
but they were just big such as but the other one the first one that he had given me was something called Lexus like it had an, an L name there it had an L name so I took that heavy drug again that antibiotic went back home and I took it and after taking it I took some you know painkillers and after taking those painkillers I I slept but while I was sleeping I was so shivering and I was so sweating at the same time I was sweating and shivering I was very uncomfortable you know I was very uncomfortable and my skin even started changing my skin started changing and when I woke up and my, my wife was like let me check at your let me look at your hands and she looked at my hands and I was my hands were so purple so purple and my breathing was not actually proper I could not even breathe and all of a sudden my chest became so heavy it was like somebody had taken 50 kg bag of cement into my chest you know i could not walk my chest was so heavy i could not even stand and even even i could not i would take two three steps and i was out of oxygen i would find myself breathing like i'm losing oxygen and all of a sudden i would want just to go sit down and sleep my body had no oxygen and um that is when i, I told my wife now if you can find a boda boda just take me back to eagles and let that those eagles guys see me and uh, there was one of my neighbors we used to call them baba baba i can't remember his name but he was just a good he was just a good man yeah he was called baba ramsi so he has, he had a son called ramsi so people used to call him baba ramsi baba ramsi simply means father of ramsi you know baba means father so i called him and this guy was actually one of the boda boda operators so i told him i want you to take me to eagles so that i check because it seems like i'm not feeling well so he took us my wife to eagles so when i reached at the eagles right at the hospital i couldn't actually walk because they were telling us to take stairs actually i was not able you know to take stairs and uh, i just had to sit down and i told them look here i cannot take those stairs i can't i will faint because i don't have oxygen and immediately those nurses rushed they came with a with a wheelchair and I, i sat in that wheelchair and when they took me in the wheelchair they took me on the other side where there was an elevator so they took me through an elevator and i went all the way up to an ever through an elevator and i i saw, i went to the doctor and the doctor looked at me because luckily enough there were no people there a lot of people had gone so the doctor just checked at me it was around 10 at night and the doctor looked at me and immediately he looked at me and he said no this guy needs oxygen you need to go to an oxygen you need to be taken to kenyatta you need oxygen we don't have oxygen facilities here so you are supposed to be taken to oxygen wow so he says for you to go to a uh, 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 oxygen facility you need to go to kenyatta hospital that is the only place they know there is an oxygen facility and then at the same time also he tells me you are not actually okay he just opened right there and then you are not okay but you have serious pneumonia You know they were not telling me that you know you have covid they told me you have serious pneumonia but the way they were behaving from the way they were behaving uh they were actually you know suspecting this guy has covid you know they they, they knew this guy has covid but they did not want to tell me that you have covid you know so they looked at me and uh they told me now you you need to take an ambulance you need to take an ambulance Uh, to Kenyatta and uh, the ambulance were charging you 5000 shillings to drop you to Kenyatta and right then I, I didn't have anything I didn't have any money you know we didn't have any money things were very tough because businesses were not working uh, you know and all that and everything is shut in this country and somebody is asking you for 5000 shillings uh, for an ambulance 
and I was like now what can we do and my wife was very confused she was calling people and uh, almost everybody was telling him uh, that uh, they have nothing they have nothing they have nothing so the only option was that we were just supposed to go back home we see wait and see uh, what tomorrow is so as uh, we were going back home because we didn't have any money for for the ambulance to take me to Kenyatta this guy who took us to the boda boda baba ramsi i i really owe him a lot and uh, i really do owe him a lot yeah I, I, and and and, and times i say heavenly father will always send angels angels to you so that uh, he may actually be able to keep you safe and i think baba ramsi was was an angel as at that time because we didn't have anything and what he did as a boda boda guy he offered to you know give pay his money you know he had only he had only about he had about 1000 1500 shillings and he told us look here this guy cannot sleep in the house this guy needs to go to the hospital you know and he told my wife we cannot afford to put him in the house so what you need to do let us just go back i will talk with these guys that have taxis uh in 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 the plot let them give us their taxi to to drop us to kenyatta we will give them some small money but let him just drop us in kenyatta so he went and we talked he talked with one of the neighbors there and the neighbor was very understanding and he he accepted and that is how I was, I was taken to kenyatta hospital so they drove me back to kenyatta hospital they drove me to kenyatta hospital and by then i'm so weak can't breathe I am just so low I can't you know so immediately in Kenyatta hospital when I arrived uh, that nurse just looked at me and she said okay immediately bring oxygen so they brought oxygen there and there and then they placed it on my nose and as I was breathing I was breathing and then they were taking they were taking out details from my wife now my wife was the one giving them the details of what because while at the hospital I just went black out you know went blackout and they placed oxygen and all of a sudden I was on a bed and I was just there on the bed with the oxygen up just breathing in oxygen and all that stuff and I'm told even they rushed in brought some drip placed a drip on me and, and and that is how I was you know that is how I was that bed now funniest enough when you are in Kenyatta one thing is that if you have if you are in Kenyatta National Hospital and during this period we were told that the pandemic was so high and funniest enough that uh, the entire country was really facing this pandemic seriously and being the Kenyatta National Hospital this is the only hospital that was serving i end we ended up realizing that during this pandemic period okay this was the hospital that was serving the region okay it was serving the region there were some of the prominent men from the region you'll find Uh, there are some sick patients even from Uganda they were being ferried to Kenyatta National Hospital all the way from Kampala Uganda they were being brought to Kenyatta National Hospital you find patients from you find even some patients from Rwanda Sudan they were actually being airlifted and they were being brought to Kenyatta they there are some patients who are coming from the borders of Tanzania they were being lifted and they were being brought to Kenyatta National Hospital there were people who were preferring better they actually check medication in Kenya other than actually having medications in their own country because the state of medical facilities in their own country was was a little bit wanting and it was overwhelmed so they were rushing into Kenya thinking that in Kenya at least medical facilities were were okay So these people were being rushed here. and I think that is why even some of the statistics of covid in Kenya actually ballooned so high because we had other foreigners also who were being brought into Kenya uh, for medical facilities and I think Kenyan doctors really overworked they really overworked because they were they were even serving uh, other nationalities and that's why sometimes I feel very bad when a Kenyan goes to these other nationalities and they treat Kenyans very badly uh, sometimes it is so sad because Kenyan doctors they did not actually discriminate that this one is a Ugandan or this one is a Rwandese or this one is a Sudanese they were able to you know 
you know uh, 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 accommodate and admit everyone and, and attend to to everyone because it was a matter of saving lives so it was very hectic when i was there even for us to be booked in so that we may get a ward so that i can be taken to the ward it was very hectic so we were just outside there at the receiving end there and you could see beds that receiving end was just another form of of a ward on its own so we could see beds and people were lying there and and, and some people even will lose their lives they will you know lose their lives while they were still there waiting uh, for doctors to attend to them and i remember there was one guy who was there i'm told uh, my wife was telling me these stories after because with me i was blackout so my wife was telling me there was a guy who was there and he had just sat at that reception end uh, he had actually finished two weeks there he came in sick and he was almost getting healed just there because he was there in a bed and no one could attend to him he was just there and and one thing i ended up realizing that in kenyatta national hospital uh sometimes if you do not have somebody or you do not have connections you may not actually be attended to and i don't blame those doctors it is because of the pressure that is there you will find one doctor attending to i don't know how many types number quite a number of patients and and, and at times if you are not connected very well you may not actually be be attended to so my we sat there we were there because i was at, i was admitted there around on sunday that was on sunday night i was admitted there and then sunday monday tuesday i was still there because the doctors had not yet come so i was just surviving with oxygen just surviving with oxygen and even though there were some nurses you know moving around asking as how are we doing and all that stuff they will take blood samples from us a go you know blood samples from us go check and all that stuff you know and and at times they will just do that for formalities because somebody will take your blood sample goes it with it in the laboratory they don't find anything again they come they, they you know they misplace it and then they come back again they tell you want to check another blood sample uh, until even there was a, one of the nurses i think my wife was very mad with her and, and told her look here what are you doing yeah what what exactly are you doing because how come how will you how come you you keep on taking blood samples from this guy without even our our knowledge you know we give you blood samples you go misplace them you come back again take another blood sample what are you exactly doing uh, uh, that is when now she ended up realizing we are not a people to joke around with you know so i sat there for the on tuesday nothing has happened so that is when now my wife decided now to call one of the members of the church uh, uh one of the members of the church she's actually a doctor that is uh working in Kenyatta National Hospital she, she's working there she's actually a doctor and her, her name was sister sara sitati uh, sister sara sitati i want to say thank you very much for what you did to me i really do appreciate you and i i, I actually applaud you as a, as a sister you really do did good well and if one day you come across this video please know that i'm really thankful of what you did and you stood with my wife uh, at a such a critical moment and a moment whereby we needed somebody to stand with us you were there with us thank you very much now sister sara sitati of course uh, she's the one who actually really did a lot of things for us uh, because knowing the challenges in kenyatta so she went and talked with a few uh, uh, doctors there who came and did examine us and after examining us and that is when I was I was booked into a ward uh, I was booked into a ward a ward called ward 42 and uh, I remember that night my wife was telling me that uh, after they had actually booked me inside that ward there was no one to help her to push me to to push my bed to the ward and, and and that word you know you have to go through so many cycles it was somewhere uh, uh, around up i think it was around in sixth floor there it is called ward 42 now ward 42 was majorly a ward that was uh, was uh, separated for covid 19 patients so if they knew you were a covid 19 patient they will take you to that ward and that is the ward that i was in and one thing is that they knew that people who had covid who will go to that ward 
the chances are that a number of them were actually passing away. They were actually leaving uh, mortality. So that, that is why every now and then they will admit somebody in that ward. After some time, that person will be taken to the morgue because he's not there. And then they will call the owners that uh, your, your patient has, has actually passed. And that is what they told my wife, that uh, we are taking your husband to the ward. And um, you, so my wife pushed. <laughs> I remember she says she pushed that 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 bed alone and she didn't know at times she didn't even at times know where she was going to. And then she will meet some guards there and the guards will tell him Ward 42 is somewhere there. And then she pushed that you know she pushed that bed closer even to the door. And can you imagine in that ward no one was allowed to come close. But you see my wife was almost getting in. And one of the doctors shouted, I think it was a nurse, shouted and said, Hey, Mama, where are you going? And uh, that is where now she stopped and she was told, Now you leave it here. We will call you. Uh, uh, we will call you. So you have your phone. Yeah, make sure your phone has enough you know, charges. So we will actually call you. So that is where I was, uh, I was taken inside that ward. And, and I got inside there, blackout. I don't know anything that is happening. Still just on oxygen. And uh, it was just oxygen after the other, oxygen after the other, oxygen after the other, oxygen after the other. And I'm told a lot of people actually passed, so many people actually passed and, and I was there. Oxygen after the other, oxygen after the other. And there was this nurse whom I didn't know that she was always communicating with my wife. Always communicating with my wife. She will come check on me and then she will go and communicate. Only to realize that it was Dr. Sarah Sitati that told her, check over that patient. And uh, she was actually, every now and then, you know, she would come, check, and then tell my wife, he's a little bit weak. He's still on oxygen. He hasn't woken up yet, you know. And uh, when I was there, I don't know exactly what happened. It was one morning, uh, these doctors were like, this, their patients who have stayed long uh, in this ward, and, 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 and we are continuing to receive more and more and more patients and, and, and the oxygen is actually becoming so limited. So this is the time now we will just have to choose yeah, which patient actually has to, to, to stay and which one has to go. Can you imagine that status whereby now doctors have to choose and it is not their will, it is because of the medical facilities were so limited. Can you imagine production of oxygen in this country, hospitals are not actually producing their own oxygen. That this oxygen is a tender given to somebody else. One person has taken a tender of supplying oxygen in all hospitals. And, and we, we, we are told that this is, it is not that uh, uh, our laboratories cannot produce this oxygen. And it is not that universities cannot produce this oxygen. But it is all political. And because of politics, Okay, it is subjected a lot of patients into so many problems. There are some of the patients who could be saved, but they ended up actually losing their lives because of this facility was just limited. Okay, this facility was, 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 was limited. Can you imagine? And uh, that morning when they were just about to decide, and uh, that is when now I felt my body was so hot. You know, I was in a blackout, but I could feel heat, a lot of heat that had come in my body. And when that heat came, my body started sweating. And when my body was really sweating, really sweating, because remember I was just sleeping, I was in blackout. I was not eating anything. It was just oxygen after oxygen. They could just come check my pulse rate and they will tell me, and they, will, they will say, he's, he's fine, he's still alive, he's still alive. He has pulse rate, he's only in a... He, you know, he's only in a coma, but he may come back. But that was the time, not the defining moment, that my body was just sweating. And it's like now blood was now flowing again into my body. And my heartbeat was just abnormal. It was really hitting so much. And I was really sweating, seriously. And then all of a sudden, I found myself opening my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, I checked around and I was like, where I am? Where is this place where I am? I didn't know. 
where I was. I actually didn't know where I was. If you tell me where I was, I didn't know. My mind was not actually working, but I could see light. And I saw, like, I was actually seated on a bed. Because immediately, I just sat on the bed. And when I sat on the bed, I started looking around. And I saw all these uh, things in my body. And I was like, what is this? And I, I see this oxygen can, and I was like, what is this? And one of the nurses came and told me, look here, it's fine. It's fine. And we thank God that you are now back. You shall be okay. And I looked around and, and I saw like some of the beds, the sheets were actually closed. And you could see these were people that were actually, you know, covered by the body, by the, by the sheet. You know, the morgue was so full. That is what I'm being told. That the morgue was so full that to an extent that they were only keeping those bodies there for some time to wait for those other morgues to be taken out of those other bodies to be taken out of the morgue so that they can transfer these bodies back to the morgue. You know, people really lost lives. And when I woke up, that sister, that nurse who was given this responsibility, she started shouting and praising God. And she was shouting and praising God. And all of a sudden other nurses came and they saw me like I'm, I'm, I'm walking. I'm sitting and they started shouting and praising God and, and, and all of a sudden uh, they started singing hymns they started singing you know these songs just of praising God you know and, 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 and all of a sudden a doctor came and when that doctor came he started now checking on me you know you know you know you know examining my pulse rate examining my heartbeat you know trying to check my temperature and all that stuff and he looked at me and he said, you are fine. And he smiled and he said, you are fine. You are fine. You are doing good. And, and, and he, you know, he, he started, you know, uh, he recommended some of the drugs that I should be given and all that stuff. But he said, you're okay. You're fine. You're okay. You've made it. You've made it. And uh, that is where now I ended up realizing that, wow, this is, this is so great. And beside me, there was uh, another guy who was also, who who, who he had just been brought in he had just been brought in and he was really really breathing so hard and you could feel his breathing and you could feel him cough so hard and and he was he was just hey man and i was so weak i was so weak i was just looking at everybody and and, and i remember telling that nurse that uh, please help me I feel so hungry, I don't know what I can eat now, but I just need something that I can drink. And she was saying, don't worry, I'm bringing something for you. And she rushed so quickly, went and brought some food for me. And, and she brought some stew, some all that, with a lot of soup, you know. And she told me, drink this, this, this one. And even she was willing even to spoon feed me, you know. And she was just willing to spoon feed me. I told her, no, look here, let me, I'll just try it my, myself. And then she took and she gave me that. And I started eating slowly by slowly, slowly, just taking those fluids slowly by slowly. And when the doctors came, and they were like, uh, yeah, he can eat, he can do that. Uh, that is very fine, that is very fine. So you can call, you can call the wife and, and tell them the news. So that is when now my wife was called. And uh, she was told, uh, this guy, he's now fine, but still very weak. But what he says, he needs fruits. And because I told the nurse that if I can get fruits, I'll be more than, than glad. So they, they told me, this guy needs fruits. You can, you can actually, you know, uh, send him fruits. So that is, that is what happened. And uh, my wife, when she heard that uh, I'm okay I've, and I need something to eat, and, they, they, and uh, what happened is that uh, they, because my phone had left it in the house, and they needed something that uh, she could actually be uh, communicating with me. So that day she went, bought food, fruits and all that. And I, and I remember uh, all her, you know, she had talked to the parents and the parents were really praying for me. And uh, she was also, she had talked even to the uncles and the aunties. And, and the uncles and aunties were also praying for me because that thing was very tough, you know. And the aunties were also praying for me, you know. They were actually praying for me. 
and I remember what I'm told that uh, one of the grandmothers uh, uh, organized a fast, that they should fast for me and, and pray for me. And I thank God for, for their prayers. I thank God for their prayers because now I realize that it was as a result of those prayers that the Lord actually brought me back. You know, the Lord actually gave me a second chance. And I also remember my mom at home also, she was really praying for me and, and asking God, like, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've lost all of my children. I've lost all of my children and, he, and he's the only one that I have. Will you want also to take this one too? You know, would you also want to take this one too? And my mom was really praying and, and asking God questions. That is, that is how my, my younger sisters are telling me. Like my mom was really asking uh, the Lord a lot of questions. And, 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 and I think that is what resulted that uh, Heavenly Father had actually to, to give me an, a, a second chance. And, and that is how I came back to life. And that is how I came back. And, and I thank God for that because it is not that I was so special that the Lord rescued me from, from that disease. Uh, it is not that I was so special in any way. But from that, the Lord will want me to, wanted me to learn uh, something that he always cares for us and he's always there for us. And the only thing is that sometimes we take things for granted and we treat those things as normal. Yet there are always miracles happening in our lives. Miracles happening in our lives. And, and this one I saw because sleeping in a ward that had so many people and a lot of people actually dying and some of them even you talk to them and you wish them good night and then the following morning the nurse will tell you uh, he's no more, he's gone. Uh, it, is, it was so sad and very scary to me. So sad and very scary to me. It's like I was, I was, I was, I was in the grave. But the Lord took me out of that grave. You know, the Lord took me out of that grave. And I saw it was him. It is not by anybody's power or might. Because the doctors had nothing to give me. They had no medicine to give me. They told me this is now your battle. It is just your body and, 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 and you. The only thing we can do is just to give you medicines. If you feel, you know, to ease the pain. That is, give you just some painkillers. But in terms of the disease, we have nothing to give you. All we can support you with is oxygen and, and maybe ease in your pain. But the rest, it is you and God. And the Lord worked it out and, and he chose that, that I stay. He chose that I stay. I remember being told that uh, members of our ward were praying so much. And uh, one of our our elders prayed and he, he was telling my wife that uh, he told God that why are you taking him, you know? Why are you taking him? Uh, we need him in this world. We need him because of Sunday school. We need him because he's a good teacher and he's been teaching us uh, things that we do understand. We need him because of Sunday school. Why are you robbing us, our Sunday school teacher? You know, <laughs> and when I was told that, I was, I was actually laughing. And, and, uh, and the brother said, people said, yes, that is what it is. And they really prayed. They really prayed so much. And, and I want to say thank you very much for all those that actually remembered me in, in, in your prayers. I, I always feel those prayers and, and my family has always been also feeling those prayers. And, and I want to say thank you very much for those prayers both from my in-laws, from my grandmothers, uh, from my aunties on, on my wife's side, uh, all of them from my father-in-law. I want to say thank you very much for, for the prayers you guys actually offered for me. And uh, the Lord actually heard you and he gave me a second chance. He gave me a second chance. And, 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 and you reasoned with him. You reasoned with him the way the book of, of Isaiah says that come, let's reason together. And, and, and this is what I always see, uh, people reasoning with the Lord, you know. Like my mom was actually telling him, this is what it is, this is my peace. Uh, this is the reason as to why I live, you know. And when you take him, I will have nothing to hold on to. I will be living for nothing. And the Lord heard her. 
you know the lord had hand and he was able to restore me he he gave me energy back again and and, and i want to say thank you very much and that is why i i was actually led you know by this feeling to actually begin this channel so that to show some appreciation to him and and to ensure that also i share my perspective of my perspective of what i know about his gospel and 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 what he has done to me and what he has done to my life and especially what he has also done to my to my family so when the doctor saw that i was actually okay and many patients were coming uh to the ward they they recommended that i be transferred from that hospital so they recommended i be taken to another hospital where uh covid patients were recuperating and uh they took me to a, a hospital called the Kenyatta University Referral Hospital so that is where i was taken and uh, uh, that is where now they were examining me as they were checking my you know my breathing my respiratory uh how my heart is functioning how my lungs are they really did a lot of examinations and all that stuff and and they said at least you are a good report you are one of the reports that has added cv to our profile that at least you've actually recovered which one now that one now can show that uh, people will have confidence in our medical facilities and especially in Kenya so i was among uh, those patients who were of good you know cv and of good reputation to the medical facilities of our country Kenya during the pandemic period so uh, that is that is how heavenly father actually helped me and uh, and and and, and uh, while at the Kenyatta uh, University Referral Hospital uh, that is where I was actually recuperating and and I want to say thank you very much for those doctors there they were also very concerned very wonderful people with very wonderful staff both uh, J- both uh, uh, subordinate staffs and 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 also staffs of the hospital uh, they were very very good and they really took took care of me uh, and and I thank God for for that because I know it is only god who actually softened their hearts and led them uh, to treat me the way they were treating me uh, because i had pa- i had parents who were really prayerful i had brothers and sisters who were actually really prayerful i had cousins and relatives and and in-laws who were also very very prayerful and i want to say thank you very much uh, for that and i always appreciate heaven father uh, for this 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 chance that he had given me a second chance and every now and then every time i look at my life i always ask myself am i living the right life you know am i living up to the standard which heavenly father requires of me and 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 one thing i always want and a desire that to be always right with him you know to be always right with him irrespective of what no matter what i would always want to be right with him and always serve him in the ways that uh, he will want me to serve him and in the ways that he has ordained me actually to serve him in this in this in this life and i would be more than glad and always uh, uh peaceful to know that uh, every time i wake up that i have that personal relationship with him and that is key in every person's life that to build that personal relationship with our savior uh, to know that he is there and to know that he cares for us uh, and this is so incredible as i walked through this journey of 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 pandemic life and uh, uh, at the end of this video i want just you to see uh, the, how i was in the hospital uh, there's a video i took and this is the time when i was actually recovering and at least i could walk because doctors were telling me to take to ensure that i at least walk ensure that i walk so that oxygen can really flow and the heart can resume its normal function of pumping oxygen uh, pumping blood and ensuring that blood oxygen circulation uh moves in my body so this is why i was walking a lot a lot around the the ward and and i think i recorded some of these things because my 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 relatives really wanted to see how i was progressing and and this is how i recorded it please have a look at this video thank you i did kenyatta national university hospital where i was being being checked for my well being especially the respiratory problem areas to see if at all I can breathe very well yes so this is the area that I'm in 
and these are some of the walls as you can see these are some of the walls you can see see this is one of the walls it's called the Mao, the Mao ward where most of the patients are and uh, this is where I am actually located. You can you can see this is this is where actually my ward where we are we are with my colleagues undertaking some of the medications that we are being prescribed by the doctors. Yes. So over here this is where the bed is. Yeah, this is where I lay myself. You can check it out, guys. You can, you can just now uh, check it out. So the bed will look like. Yes. And these are some of the waters we drink here. These are some of the waters we drink here. So what they say is that the disease you only need to have take a lot of fruits, vegetables and drink a lot of water. And also you do some exercise. So that is what has actually been encouraged so much for anyone that uh, he's, he's actually wants to prevent this disease from occurring. Okay. So these are some of my colleagues, you can see them. Oh, sorry, I blocked the camera. So these are some of my colleagues, you can see them there. They are actually recovering, recuperating very well. And just like the way it is, following the instructions. That is what makes you look good. Yes. So, I'll take you to another chamber. So this is this is the corridor. Corridor. That is where we are being served medication. And especially that is where we meet the doctors. Just right over there. That's where we meet the doctors. There. And sometimes we will need uh, we will need uh, hot water and uh, 